All right. Here we go. Solutions Journalism Network High Conflict Book Launch Event for Amanda Ripley. Um, my name is Len. I'm joined by my colleagues, Jules, Michael, and Alan for this special event. And we are so thrilled to have you joining us right now. We've got people from all around the world uh, tuning into this event. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And before we jump in, if you will, Please show some love in the chat for our colleague, singer, songwriter, and guitarist, Kristen Merritt. You just heard one of Kristen's original songs, and she has many more, uh, including a new album coming out this year. So in just a few moments, you will see us drop a whole bunch of stuff for her in the chat so you can follow along and uh, also follow her work. All right, so a virtual party is not a real virtual party unless there's some type of icebreaker. And in the spirit of this particular celebration, we have a high conflict icebreaker planned for all of you. And don't worry, this will be fun and hopefully even humorous for some of you. So here's the icebreaker. What is the silliest thing that you ever argued over? All right, so think about that for just a moment. And here's what you're gonna do. And here's why you want to participate. You're gonna drop this, you know, your answer, your response in the chat. And at the very end, Amanda is going to pick a winner and she'll pick the response that most intrigues her will get a special prize. So at the end of the hour, we will uh, jump into that. So again, the silliest thing you ever argued over. Don't be shy. And yes, you do see a crock pot on your screen. What's that about? There's a story behind that. And Amanda will share about that in just a bit. 
All right. So this book release chat with Amanda, which will hopefully uh, feel like an intimate fireside chat, is especially meaningful uh, for all of us at Solutions Journalism Network. Uh, a few years ago, this question surfaced, you know, what if journalists covered controversial issues differently? Um, what if they did it based on how humans actually behave when they're polarized and suspicious? And Amanda spent a number of months investigating that question and others uh, and wrote this incredibly powerful essay complicating the narratives, which many of you are familiar with. And that piece was really the impetus for our initiative here at SJN of the same name, complicating the narratives. So we took Amanda's findings, created a training curriculum for journalists, uh, and through her initial work, we're teaching newsrooms um, all around the country, all around the world, really, how to better report on polarizing issues without causing further divides. And high conflict is the result of years of research by Amanda, and it shows all of us, including journalists, you know, a different way to do conflict. So today, as Amanda shares really the journey of this book and introduces us to some of the characters, um, you know, those whose personal stories are incredibly powerful and have lessons for all of us, we will be able to imagine another way to do conflict. All right. So we are also incredibly thrilled to have Sabrina Tavernisi joining us today. Sabrina is a national correspondent for the New York Times and I would say a journalist who truly embraces complexity and nuance when it comes to her reporting. And I just am thrilled. So welcome Sabrina and Sabrina will lead a Q&A conversation with Amanda a bit later during today's event. All right, so without further ado, we're gonna do a little technical swap in here. So I am going to stop sharing that screen and I got another screen to share with you. So just give me one moment. And we've got a book trailer to share with all of you. Uh, so here is a, uh, this is the book trailer for High Conflict. After the trailer, Amanda herself will take the virtual floor and share her High Conflict journey. And if you will, please, any questions that come up, we want questions. So be sure to drop them in the chat because we do have an audience Q&A planned at the end. And here we go. Four years ago, I went on a quest to try to understand how people get out of really ugly conflict, personal, political, all kinds of conflict. To do this, I followed people who were trapped in different disputes all over the world. A politician in California, a former gang leader in Chicago, an environmental activist in England, regular frustrated Democrats in New York City and regular frustrated Republicans in Michigan. And I realized that I'd been asking the wrong question. It's not about getting out of conflict. It's about getting out of high conflict. High conflict is the kind we're seeing a lot of today. It can start small, but it gradually takes on a life of its own. Our brains behave differently and everything we do to try to end the conflict usually makes it worse. But these people I followed were all at some point trapped in high conflict, and they aren't anymore. They're still fighting. They're just much better at it and much healthier because they've created something I've come to know of as good conflict, which can still be stressful and heated, but it goes somewhere productive. Find out how real people have made that journey from high conflict to good conflict and how the rest of us could too. All right, journalist and writer Amanda Ripley, the floor is yours and you should be all set to share your screen. I'm getting there. It's happening. It's happening. Don't fear. You got this. <laughs> this is all this is all just the suspense. And as you do this, Amanda, just for those that are meeting you for the first time, you will want a notebook because Amanda drops these like nuggets and you'll want to write them down. So just that heads up. 
Okay. Um, guys, I am so excited to see you all. I'm not sure this is really happening. Like it's so fantastic to have Alain and Michael and Alan and Jules and Sabrina and all of you here. It's like, I can, I can hardly breathe. As you see, I'm having real trouble making the switch to screen sharing. <laughs> I'm flooded, but I am so glad to be doing this. It is cosmically appropriate that my first official talk about this book would be with you all. Uh, this book grew in part out of the Complicating the Narratives project uh, that I wrote for Solutions Journalism several years ago, which has now grown into a much more sophisticated science under the visionary leadership of Alain. Uh, so thank you to everyone at Solutions Journalism. Thank you to Sabrina, whose work I loved before I even met her. So it was super exciting to, to now call her my friend and colleague. Um, and I owe a special thanks to Alain's very generous and very patient TV news editor friend, Marty Kaufman, for putting that trailer together. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is just give you a quick sort of sneak peek into some of the characters in the book. And then Sabrina and I will chat about uh, how some of this might apply to journalism, and then we will open it up for questions. Um, so I think if we think about complicating the narrative, that original project was trying to answer the question, how can we make conflict useful again as journalists? The book is trying to answer the question, you know, how can we make conflict useful again as humans, right? Which, you know, are related, but not the same. Uh, so in both cases, I just want to acknowledge that this problem is really hard and uh, the answers are complex. And I am not going to get it totally right, not here and not ever, um, but I'm going to keep trying and I need your help. I do think that this is one of the central challenges of our time and it's going to take all of us to figure it out. Um, fundamentally, this book is a solution story. You know, it's, it's, a, it's on the long side, but it is a solution story because it's an attempt to find the people who have been stuck in really ugly conflict or communities or countries and gotten to a better place. Uh, what can we learn from them? What do they wish they had known? Um, so I wanna start by introducing you to some, some of you may already know this person, but Gary Friedman is a veteran conflict expert, a reformed lawyer who has helped thousands of people navigate really hard conflicts and who helped create the field of conflict mediation decades ago. When I interviewed him years ago for the first time, he mentioned as an aside that he had, uh, he had run for office as a novice politician in his tiny town in California, and it was not going as planned. So we stayed in touch. And unlike most people who have lost their minds in conflict, Gary was willing to tell the world about it. Um, so now I'm going to do a little switcheroo here to get us to the video. Almost there. I'm Gary Friedman, um, mediator, lawyer, uh, trainer, um, been focusing on conflict for the uh, last 40 some odd years um, and a uh, failed politician. I had an idea that with all my experience as a, a mediator um, and working so much with conflict and being able to help people heal themselves through conflict, uh, that I could do that for the community. Wouldn't that be just fantastic to, to be able to bring those skills because a lot of people were upset with how community, uh, our local government was operating. So I ran, we won. Uh, it was a very exciting time and uh, became this kind of utter failure. I felt like I was just caught in this uh, trap where I couldn't uh, extricate myself. Uh, and the more I would try to extricate myself, the worse it would get. Once I admitted 
that I was part of the. Okay. So I'm going to just pause us there to talk about what we just heard. Um, Gary used the words that he was caught in a trap. And that's a great way to think about high conflict. And he said that the more he tried to extricate himself, the harder it got. Um, also a great way <laughs> to think about high conflict. And we'll talk more about that. But I want to let him finish here. Um, actually, in a very, uh, even though it's really hard to do that, uh, it's actually uh, freeing and liberating to realize, because I realize when I'm part of a problem, I can change me. <laughs> you know, if I'm in a problem with somebody else and I want to change them, that's hard. But if I want to change me, uh, I can always do that. I've, and so actually I felt much more empowered to know I could be different. Um, and this is not who I am. You know, I was never thrilled <laughs> with the way politicians behave. But I do have much more of appreciation now of how easy it is to get caught. So I'll, I'll look at that and say, oh, look at how caught they are. And, and kind of wanting to kind of call them up and say, guess what? I got this idea how you could do that differently and I think it would be more successful. Of course, I would never do such a thing, but it's, I, I can see it a little more, a little more clearly. Okay. And we're going to go back. And I want to just talk about what we saw there. Um, Gary talks about how he felt um, trapped about how everything he did to get out of it made it worse. And then he realized what was happening and changed what he was doing. Um, but I think it gives you a little snapshot of how magnetic high conflict is. So Gary's story is mostly a cautionary tale, right? If, the, if one of the world's leading experts in conflict cannot resist the trap of high conflict, then there's pretty much no way that I could. Um, so then, you know, where does that leave us? Well, the first thing to do is to think about what actually the difference is and what high conflict is versus good conflict. So researchers have different definitions. Some people call it intractable conflict. Some people define it different ways. The definition I found most useful and true to life was a conflict that becomes self-perpetuating and all-consuming in which almost everyone ends up worse off. It's typically an us versus them conflict, right? Um, so this, is, this can start small over almost anything. And that's why Gary's story is useful because it's like a mini shoebox diorama of high conflict. Um, the thing that blew up in their town was about an increase in the water rate, okay? So uh, it, it can sound silly to outsiders, but it really can be almost anything. And that's because usually when we are in high conflict, we're not arguing about what the conflict's really about, right? So it wasn't really about the water rate increase, right? That's the crock pot imagery from the beginning here when you talked about the silliest things you argued about. Um, somebody talked, I know in the chat about how to fairly divide up plantains was, a, was one of the things they've argued about or uh, banana bread, also a nice one. Um, so really when we're, when we're arguing about banana bread, you know, what are we really arguing about? That is the question. Um, and, and that's how things can explode. The crock pot is an allusion to a, a divorcing couple that got into a huge war over who was going to get possession of the crock pot in the divorce. Um, and that's because they weren't really talking about what the crock pot was really about. And for the wife, eventually it came out that uh, she had grown up in a home where her parents would have a you know, pot roast in the crock pot cooking all Sunday afternoon and she would smell it and it meant something to her. And so they'd gotten one for their wedding, but they'd never used it. Like she and her husband didn't even like to cook, honestly. So, uh, but the crock pot was something she wanted to hold on to. And then why did the husband want the crock pot? Because the wife wanted it, right? Uh, and she had wanted the whole divorce. So this was like one thing he could go to the mat on and, and claw back some sense of control. Usually people don't even realize what the crock pot's about. Uh, so that's where journalists can be helpful in trying to figure out what is this conflict really about. Um, this is just a little chart that gives you a sense. I mean, we could come up with many different words here, but gives you a sense of the difference between good conflict, which is productive and goes somewhere interesting, and high conflict, which tends to be this kind of trap that pulls everybody down. So good conflict is surprise as possible. Um, it's more fluid. You can have many different emotions, uh, whereas high conflict, you tend to have the same two or three over and over, usually fear and anger, sometimes hatred, sometimes humiliation. 
So you get the sense that there are some differences here that while are, it's you know not written in stone, I find you can you can usually <laughs> tell the difference between a good conflict and a high conflict. So uh, in Gary's case, he went into politics to make it less toxic and more inclusive, right? Very good intentions. And within a few months, he was making it more toxic and less inclusive without intending to, right? So this is the real fundamental threat of high conflict is that everyone I followed in high conflict has eventually started to mimic the behavior of their adversaries without realizing, right? So that's the risk of high conflict. <clears throat> so how did this happen? Like how did Gary of all people get pulled into high conflict in this tiny shoebox diorama, right? Uh, there's a few conditions that seem to lead to high conflict when they are present. And we don't have time to get into all of them here, but one of them that I think might be useful uh, for us to think about as journalists in particular is the presence of conflict entrepreneurs. So conflict entrepreneurs are people or platforms or companies who are exploiting the conflict for profit or more often actually for attention, meaning, power, that kind of thing. In Gary's case, there was a neighbor friend of his who was his primary advisor on his campaign, who was a professional political organizer and operative. And she thought of politics as a war between good and evil and fighting and winning and losing. And that's how she talked about it. And soon Gary talked about it that way too. Um, and you know, soon it becomes about something else, right? Uh, when you're very focused on winning, as is obvious in Congress, you can end up shredding the things that you hold dear, but it is set up that way, right? So politics by design in the United States creates high conflict. Uh, the other thing that was present is what in Gary's case and most high conflicts is some kind of false binary where we reduce reality or people or choices into just two, right? Uh, yes, no, black, white, Democrats, Republican, in Gary's case, it was he had divided his neighbors into the new guard, which is how he thought of himself and his allies as the sort of the upstarts, the change agents. And then the old guard was the status quo, you know, the, the, the previous incumbents. Uh, interestingly, in this case, the old guard did not know about this label until I mentioned it to one of them while interviewing them for the book. So this was something that was made up in Gary's head with his allies. Um, they, the old guard did not think of themselves as a block, right? Um, they did not think of themselves as old, right? <laughs> so uh, again, it's sort of an extreme example, right? Obviously Republicans do think of themselves as Republicans uh, and Democrats as well, but it shows you how easy it is to fall into this and also how winner take all zero sum uh, political systems tend to lead to more high conflict. And we know this from the research that countries that have third parties and ranked choice voting and those kinds of proportional representation tend to be less polarized and have more trust. And even if your candidate loses, you feel like the system is fair. Um, so that's, that's an obvious change that we can and, and should make if we want to <laughs> reduce high conflict in the United States. And some states are, are moving in that direction. Um, so I wanna now move on to introduce you to another character uh, from the book we sort of started out with Kurt, with Gary, because it's a sort of very small, almost charming example of high conflict. And I wanna to move to a more high stakes example of high conflict and what happens when high conflict happens in a place that is dealing with more trauma and more violence uh, than Gary was dealing with. Um, so Curtis Toller was at some point trapped by high conflict on the south side of Chicago he now works for Chicago Cred, helping to prevent violence in the streets of Chicago. Um, and again, like Gary, uh, was willing to talk about the journey that he's been on, for which I'm very, very grateful. And now we're gonna do this switch one more time. I'm, I'm not getting better at it, but just trust me that it is complicated beyond your wildest imagination. <laughs> Um, okay, there we go. Oh, I think I am getting better. Yeah, I'm getting very gradually better. Okay, here we go. My name is Curtis Toller, what I do. Uh, some people call me the peacemaker. I don't know where it came from, but it just kind of stuck. 
Um, and I think uh, how I really became passionate or, you know, start doing the work is that I was always involved in conflict, either directly or indirectly. Um, I was involved in a gang, which I'll refer to as an organization because gangs has such a negative connotation to it. And I, and I know, and I believe that everyone that's a part of a gang are not bad people. Right. So I, I'll refer to it as an organization. So I became a part of an organization probably at around the age of nine who were, uh, they were in a, uh, a war, but we'll call it a confrontation that had been going on already for about 20 years. Once I became part of the organization and then I grew through the ranks. So I inherited this 20 year confrontation and became the leader, <laughs> if you will, of this confrontation kind of by default. Uh, so I know a lot about confrontations and being a part of them and also, you know, how to deal with them. Okay. So Curtis was surrounded by a lot of violence as a child, which I describe in detail in the book. Um, but he ended up in a sort of vendetta against a rival gang called the Gangster Disciples for many years, um, all of which started over uh, a murder for which he blamed the Gangster Disciples. And only many years later, found out that it was not actually gang related. And this is also a very common pattern to a lot of high conflicts and particularly heartbreaking pattern. Um, many high conflicts are built on mythology at some point and figuring out what percentage is mythology and what percentage is not is maybe partly our jobs, um, but it's hard. So uh, Curtis, as he talks about himself freely today, was a conflict entrepreneur in this context for many years what's really useful is he is able to talk about the motivations that he had as a conflict entrepreneur. Because to get out of high conflict or prevent it even better, you need to distance yourself from conflict entrepreneurs. And sometimes you can't. And then it's really important to understand them. Like what is motivating them? And it's usually not just one thing, right? And it's really important to try to understand them so that there may be opportunities at some point to, um, to seize an opportunity in one of their motivations that's outside the conflict, if that makes sense. Let me let me let Curtis tell it because he's much better at it. Usually the people who have the most say so or who are most directly involved in the conflict, they want the conflict to end, but it's the folks that surround them, the people that I call the agitators and the instigators that want to keep the conflict going. Right? So me, it, 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 it went from, okay, I have a real dislike or disdain, and in my mind, I had made it a hatred towards the other group, right? And so I kept on pushing that it was because of this uh, war that was going on for 20 or 30 plus years. But then it also began to be that I don't want them to come on my territory to start selling narcotics. And, you know, either I was doing it consciously or subconsciously, Sometimes I wanted the conflict to continue because it gave me the opportunity to um, to show how much power I actually had or thought I had. If that made if that made sense, like as long as the the conflict uh, was going on, a lot of conflicts sometimes are internal, and I had an internal conflict that I was dealing with that caused a lot of external conflict. So once I was able to to deal with the internal, then a lot of the external conflicts uh, just stopped happening. It was just from being physically abused uh, and and being able to deal with that. But it takes help with dealing with some of those internal conflicts, and sometimes we don't want to we don't want to get the help that's actually needed. And that's you know what I tell a lot of the, the young men and women that I work with who are in these external conflicts that in order to really stop that external conflict, it's a lot of internal conflicts that you need to deal with. So one of the things that I love about talking to Curtis is the layers of complexity. You know, the longer he talks, the more complexity you heard in the motivations, right? The, the first one was the obvious one, the war he was in, the rivalry with the, uh, with the other gang. 
uh, the next one was the profit motive, right, um, from the drug trade. And then he talks about the internal conflict that motivated him as well. Um, and one way he found to deal with the pain that he was carrying was to spread it around, which is very common, right? Um, so those are some of the challenges, some of the motivations of conflict entrepreneurship and high conflict. Um, and let's just let Curtis wrap us up by talking about the work he does now in Chicago with young men and women trying to help other people make the shift that he made from high conflict to good conflict, but do it sooner. Um, and I, I wonder if you, when you're listening, if you could help me think about whether anything Curtis says can be applied to journalism and to the conflict, other conflicts that we may be dealing with uh, in the world today. In 15 of the most violent communities uh, here in Chicago, they've said that there's an estimation of about 2,000 different groups, which are composed of about 30 to maybe a thousand members. A lot of the conflicts that's going on here in Chicago and across the, the country, especially in, in the urban communities, you know, I would say about 70% of the conflicts start from social media, right? From a humiliation, from a post <laughs> when someone now feels that they're disrespected. So now they have to deal with the disrespect or the, hum the humiliation in a violent way. And, you know, it be, really depends on how many followers the person who humiliated you have or how many followers you have of how bad the humiliation is, <laughs> right? And so, yeah, it, it's a big thing and it plays a major part in a lot of the conflicts that I deal with. Something that we use here in Chicago a lot, uh, we call them non-aggression agreements where the two sides are not in a peace treaty. Uh, some people may still get shot, but there's rules to engagement. <laughs> and so whether it's we won't go on each other's side of town or if we see you with uh, your mother or your child, we'll give you a pass. And hopefully those minor steps can turn into major steps. The more time and the more distance and the more things that can happen in between the conflict or during the conflict makes it more easier to come to a resolution. Okay. So uh, one of the things that's really striking when you chronicle people in high conflict is how similar um, the behavior is with different contexts, right? Across very different conflicts, different stakes, different consequences. But the behavior is, is quite similar. Um, okay, let me go back here. We're almost done. I know it's painful. Okay, there we go. So um, Curtis talked about how social media can incite high conflict by spreading around humiliation and social pain very efficiently. And we see that in politics and other conflict as well, but in, in gangs, it, it ends in violence uh, every day. So it's an extreme example of how social media, as it's designed, doesn't have to be that way, spreads around high conflict and uh, makes it contagious. We've also heard about a tactic that he uses to slow conflict down, which is hugely important in every high conflict, uh, which is a non-aggression pact, which I would recommend for many, many different kinds of conflicts. Uh, and that creates some rules of engagement, right? Which is the only way humans can stay in good conflict. And it doesn't always work. People violate non-aggression pacts in Chicago all the time, uh, but it creates a mechanism to complain about the violation instead of just immediately retaliating. So it slows down the conflict, which is hugely important. Uh, thank you for letting me share those stories with you. I'm sorry, it was a little disjointed. I'm, I'm still kind of working this all out, but I, I'm really grateful to be able to, to share some snippets with you um, and, and wanted to give you a few takeaways to take home with you about high conflict. The first being that it is different from good conflict. Good conflict is great. We need more of it, not less. Um, be aware of who conflict entrepreneur is. Contra conflict entrepreneurs are 
and try to distance yourself from them if you don't want to be in high conflict. They could be on TV, they could be in your life, they could be on social media. Resist binary choices, whether it's in your uh, school or neighborhood or country or church, whatever it is, try to have more than two groups. <laughs> it sounds simple, but there's a ton of really interesting research on this that humans just do not do well when they are in two oppositional groups and then slow down the conflict. Lots of ways to do that, but that seems to be really key to getting out of high conflict and getting to a healthier place. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Sabrina and thank you all for listening. Hello everyone. I am so excited to be here for Amanda's book launch. Um, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, um, you know, this book and Amanda's ideas, um, I feel that Amanda's kind of the, the sort of doctor who has diagnosed a disease that I keep bumping into and didn't really have a name for. Um, you know, in my reporting, I've spent a lot of time since 2016 um, talking to people about political and cultural divide issues. Um, I've um, talked to mostly to conservatives, um, you know, kind of trying to explain um, how we got to where we were in 2016, what happened. Um, I think everyone was kind of, you know, when I say everyone, I mean New York Times readers <laughs> were kind of reeling um, for certainly for a number of months after, after 2016, after the election. And I sort of set about, um, I set about trying to uh, trying to decode that for people, kind of get under the get under the skin of it, um, and I quickly came to understand that, uh, you know, there was so much that I didn't know and that I was uh, doing kind of wrong. Um, you know, uh, one I remember one man once correcting me. Um, I was sort of glibly and quickly said, "Well, but you know, you're a Trump supporter, right?" And he said, Sabrina, I voted for Trump. I don't support him. You know, that there, there, there are lots of, um, you know, it's, it, they're not, they are no monoliths um, and you need to be really specific uh, and just make no assumptions about any person uh, when you go in to have a conversation with them because oftentimes they do surprise you. Um, I do, I have found that in terms of the disease, which I will get to, um, you know, this is something that um, we as journalists, I think, kind of are also part of. We are part of this society. Um, this is also something that is afflicting us. And it's extremely difficult to, uh, to see it sometimes. And this is why I love so much the way that Amanda and, and the, the Journalism Network talks about complicating the narrative. Because, you know, I do hear often at, um, you know, large meetings at the New York Times, oh, you know, readers really love this, or readers love this. And then, and I sometimes think to myself, okay, yes, um, you know, there are a lot of kind of exciting and, and, I would say exciting is the wrong word, um, you know, sort of red meat Trump stories, as I, as I sometimes call them, that, um, you know, readers love to read because we love to hate these certain things about kind of, you know, essentially what has become, you know, the other side in this American political conflict. And uh, that's easy to do because people click on it. People want it. It's like eating potato chips, it's like eating cookies, you know, um, get this sort of sugar high and it feels good and you feel, um, you know, morally like you're on the right side of things and, and only reasonable people would, of course, reasonable people would agree with you. Um, but I think really, and I think really in a lot of ways helped by um, talks that Amanda and I have had going back a couple of years now, you know, the complexity actually is something that readers like too. Uh, and it's, it's, it, 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 it has kind of surprised me this fact. It's scary because you think, well, people won't like it on Twitter and you know, people will, you know, we won't get any clicks. But I have to say that some of the pieces where I've tried to do this the hardest, um, I have had the most, I've had really surprisingly uh, favorable responses to. I did a, a piece um, about a young man who had vandalized a mosque in Western Arkansas. 
And, you know, um, the piece, and it was very ugly. It was swastikas drawn on this mosque. And, um, you know, it was, it was, um, the kid was kind of a skinheady kid who was, was, um, you know, grew up poor, was very confused young man. Um, And, and essentially, in the piece, and I, I, it really was a story of the kid's life. And what had happened was the kid had written a letter from prison to the mosque members apologizing for what he had done. Um, but, you know, it was the piece ran right around Charlottesville, shortly after Charlottesville happened, actually. And so I sort of felt this um, not in the pit of my stomach that, oh my gosh, you know, this kid and this, this piece is going to run. And I'm basically asking people to kind of live in his life a little bit and try to kind of see things through his eyes. And maybe this is just going to be too big of an ask for readers. I mean, we just had this whole crazy Charlottesville thing. And I think, and so I was actually preparing him to, you know, you might have to take down your social media. You know, you might, you know, you might get a lot of messages. Not all of them will be good. Um, You know, this is someone who, this is just, you know, journalism was just not his world at all. I mean, he, um, um, you know, he didn't know any of this stuff. And, and, and I was bracing myself. And then when the piece went up, um, he had, he and his family were just overwhelmed with really, really, really wonderful, um, thoughtful comments. And I think it was because the piece had some room to breathe. You got to understand him as a person. And yes, you might've been repulsed by what he did. Um, but then you got to, because you got a fuller view of who he was, you know, you could kind of, um, you could kind of have, you could kind of see where he was coming from and have some, some, some empathy. And I think kind of learn something. Um, So I think that, that this is just an incredibly important work because Amanda has actually done the work of thinking through these patterns for us. So literally buy the book and read it like, like you're gonna, like, it is like your life depends on it. Because for me, I do feel that, you know, journalism generally has started to sort of fall into this us and them trap. I mean, I, you know, I'm in conversations all the time where it's, you know, they, 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 oh, those Republicans, but it's like, who are we talking about here? Um, Was he a Trump supporter? Was he a Trump voter? Many, many different types of, um, types of flavors. Uh, um, And, and I think that, that, I think Amanda is going to help us through the, um, the, the identifying those times and those places where we're starting to fall into that. Um, and just, just incredibly helpful, lucid, and really quite, uh, I think, an emergency moment for our society and our culture right now that we learn these things and that we internalize them. Because if we don't, I don't, you know, I don't know where, I don't know where we're going, honestly. I think the past year has really scared me. Um, can I transition to a question or two for Amanda? Yeah, and thank you, Sabrina, for sharing that. And, you know, Sabrina, how long were you in Russia? I was in Russia from, um, I mean, before, I was in Russia before, I came to Russia before I came to journalism. So I I actually moved to Russia in 1994, uh, and then I left in 2003. Okay, so I just mentioned that because um, it's very, I find some of the most helpful perspectives on our polarization come from people who have seen it in other countries, who have seen the decimation of trust play out in other countries. Um, so I just throw that out there because that, that is really valuable because she, Sabrina has seen it from afar and up close. Um, thank you for that. Um, I guess maybe we could do one or two questions and then open it yeah. up. Does that sound... Yeah, I guess one question I would have for you, Amanda, which you know probably is on a lot of people's minds, is is would you say that the U.S. is in high conflict? That we as a country are? Yes. <laughs> you know, a couple <laughs> years ago, I might have been like, well, on the one hand, on the other, but now, I mean, I just every every box is checked. You know, the preconditions for high conflict uh, include a, a corrupt system. Right. I mean, we, we could be worse for sure, but you think about what's happening and the level of distrust and 
the sense that the system is rigged, particularly the political system uh, and owned by money, moneyed interests, that, that is a factor. It could be worse, right? It is not as bad here as it is in many, many places. Um, the other factors are uh, conflict entrepreneurs. You know, we have obviously incentivized conflict entrepreneurs. It is, there's no disincentive that I can see at the moment. That's a big problem. And uh, powerful binary group identities, which we have particularly because of our, the kind of system we have, um, as well as humiliation. Humiliation is a, is a prerequisite typically to, and humiliation is subjective, right? Like if you have a, a particular TV news network and pundits and politicians framing everything as humiliating for 20, 30 years, it will feel humiliating. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's conflict entrepreneurs interact with humiliation and frame things as humiliating, which we have. What do you think? You know, I think, I think that things have gotten much worse. And, you know, I, I mean, I was asked by our, I was asked by our executive editor, uh, I guess the summer of 2019 to look at this question of, um, which, which might seem kind of strange in retrospect, but, but um, you know, yes, c Congress is polarized. Yes, you know, our political elite is, is very divided, but our people are Americans, which I think actually is a very good question and a very yeah. deep question. Um, and, you know, I kind of, you know, looking through everything and then spending a lot of time with folks talking, kind of the conclusion I came to was not necessarily, you know, um, it's, 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 I think we in newspaper, newspaperies tend to say, you know, uh, in our polarized times, we couldn't possibly, you know, this, this, this is sort of how things work. But, you know, when you talk to people in, um, in towns and places, uh, they uh, kind of, you know, say, politics isn't really that important to me. And I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm living my life and I'm getting my kids to school. And, and you know, when a New York Times reporter asks me a question about politics, I'll answer it politely, but um, that doesn't mean I'm thinking about it all day long. Um, having said that, you know, fast forward a year, I was doing that actually in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, and then fast forward a year, I was in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the summer of 2020. Of course, you know, run up to a big election, a big transfer of power potentially. So, you know, really nervous moment. And I think, we, you know, for any of us who've studied democracies in other places, it's a very dangerous moment, potentially. It's potentially a moment where violence can happen. Um, everybody was thinking about it. You know, I, I think it was just kind of, you know, I mean, part, part, part of it I think was Trump, you know, he's just such a, I mean, even people who were like very recent immigrants had kind of tuned in and, you know, they're usually just kind of busy with their, you know, small businesses. And so it was really kind of, it had sort of seeped into the population in a really, really deep way. Um, I don't know. I, I do think, you know, the partisan stuff is so, you know, it it is, it coats everything. I mean, you know, I was, you know, writing about masks, which you'd think, you know, why is that political? Writing about, you know, vaccines, why is that particularly political? I mean, everything, uh, you know, when you look at the polling and the views and the numbers, you know, the biggest divides are um, by kind of affiliation with political groups. So I do think it's, it's, it's potentially very dangerous. And as a journalist, you know, you don't want to be the, the guy who's going around the United States in 1857 and saying, well, I don't know, no one here really cares about slavery. No one out here owns slaves. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, you know? It's like, why are you, you know, you, you need to, you need to kind of look at all layers in, in order to be able to kind of predict the future. And that's what I feel like your book is helping us do. Yeah, well, there's an interesting paradox, right? It's like uh, most Americans, I'm glad you brought this up. Most Americans want this to stop. Like they are exhausted by the exactly. conflict. They are avoiding the products we create actively like they are the plague, like actively avoiding news. News avoidance is higher in the United States than any other country. Um, so this is behavior that tells us they want out of whatever this is, that they're not really in it most people and they, whatever it is, they want it to change. Um, and I think that's still true. So there's an opportunity there, right? And the challenge is that in high conflict, it's the extremists who take over. They're the ones on Twitter. They're the ones on, in, the, on, in the news most often, right? So you lose that sense. Like I was saying the other day that um, 
when you open Twitter as a journalist, there should be a warning that pops up like on a cigarette box, you know, when they started that, that says eight out of 10 Americans do not use this service. <laughs> That's it. That's all you have to say, right? Like, but it's, it's so, it's so distorts our lens on the world and our sense of belonging and, uh, you know, uh, how things resonate or don't resonate. So, um, so there's a huge opportunity in that duality, right? Like that, you know, people on the extremes, more in common does the best work on this, right? Uh, identifying the exhausted majority versus the others. But um, now you can tell that Sabrina and I could do this literally all day. <laughs> but I want to bring in, out. <laughs> bring in some other uh, some other questions from from the audience. Alan, do you want to? Yeah. All right. This is uh, from an anonymous attendee. But what are some specific steps? Uh, that people can take to go from high-end conflict to healthy conflict that you discovered through your research or people doing research in conflict? Yeah, so individually, which I think is what the question is asking, what can people do to make that shift, right? And so it could be in any kind of conflict, political, professional, personal. Um, so the things that I have seen in all the people I studied and in the research is to, first of all, slow down the conflict. And there's different ways of doing that, right? One way is to distance yourself from conflict entrepreneurs, like we talked about. So change your social media feed or get off social media. I, I actually prefer changing it because I think it's important to have voices on social media that are not um, extremists, right? And conflict entrepreneurs, but depends on the situation. It could be, you know, someone in your family who usually every divorce lawyer will tell you about, like, there's almost always people in the wings who are stoking the conflict or conversely making it better, making it more constructive. So there's this really important role of the invisible third party and, uh, and being conscious of those conflict entrepreneurs, you know, who are they? Do you want to create some distance from them, literal or virtual? Um, and another thing is, is to really look for saturation points. This is something that I find helpful thinking about really wicked problems like polarization is like, there are these shocks that happen and it could happen even with a divorcing couple, you know, God forbid a child gets sick. It's a shock, it's a saturation point and it can change, it can upend high conflict. It can make it worse or much better. Right. So there's an opportunity in these kinds of shocks to the system. The pandemic was one, right, which was clearly not seized at the national level, but I'm sure it was in some individual schools or homes. Right. And then, you know, January 6th was another saturation point. Again, I'm not sure it was seized, but I'm sure it was for some people a saturation point, a turning point in the high conflict. So that, those are a few things to think about in trying to slow down conflict and create some space between your, yourself and the conflict entrepreneurs in your midst. I'm already mad that we won't get to all of these questions because I know we're gonna run out of time, but um, let's see. Um, in the spirit of solutions journalism, for anybody here who doesn't know, solutions journalism has four major pillars, we always say, one of which is you have to explore limitations and caveats of a, of a promising response to a problem. Uh, so what is, a limitation. I mean, I guess the fact that the conflict is so terrible is a limitation, but uh, what is a limitation that we still face in getting out of the trap of high conflict? Also asked by an anonymous attendee. Okay. Um, so many, there's so many. <laughs> I love this question. Um, one, I'll just talk, I mean, I, there's many ways I can answer this, but in the time we have, I'll talk about the internal tensions I feel about it and I feel about the book and the premise of the book. So um, a lot of what I, because I'm following people and communities who made that shift, a lot of what I recommend or come up with or what they recommend is about internal or individual level work. And we know that's super important and typically neglected in conflict, even in like war, okay? You also need to have structural societal change, right? So I sort of struggle in the book with how much to talk about that, right? Peace treaties, reconciliation, reparations, major social change, that's super important. And, and sort of both have to happen. And that was a tension in the book is like, how much do you talk about each? Um, and I think the book biases a bit for the internal journey. Um, and you know, that's, that's a limitation. Um. 
let's see. Oh, now everyone's asking questions at 1254. Um, we talked about this a little bit. From James, how complicit is journalism in stoking high conflict? We talked about that a little, but how can journalists shepherd public discourse from high conflict to good conflict? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I think a lot about is, you know, how can I avoid being a conflict entrepreneur as a journalist, right? Because there are, again, tons of structural incentives, financial incentives, ego incentives to be a conflict entrepreneur. And so sometimes I think about like a sort of litmus test of which a newsroom could do and come up with their own or just an individual reporter for, for like asking questions it, when you're covering conflict or controversy, right? Um, asking some sort of litmus test questions before you do it. Um, you know, am I illuminating anything about this conflict? Am I, will people leave this story understanding something uh, about themselves, the other side, or the conflict that they didn't understand before? Uh, if the answer is no, maybe you're being a conflict entrepreneur. <laughs> or you're the risk of that, right? Uh, so sort of thinking about what is our goal here, particularly in conflict, Alain, you know, does, does this beautifully in talking to newsrooms about, you know, what is the narrative we're trying to complicate? And it depends on your audience, uh, uh, right? Increasingly, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is very different from one audience to the next, but thinking about what is, is their narrative accurate, full, rich, and useful? Is it illuminated? If so, great, carry on. If not, like how can I, as a journalist, help make it fuller, richer, more accurate? Um, so I don't know if that's sort of a vague answer, but that's how I think about it is, are there sort of questions we could ask ourselves? Just like when we cover suicide, right? You don't just cover a suicide cluster, I mean, hopefully, without realizing the harm you're doing, right? So there's a kind of protocol that a lot of newsrooms have come up with in cooperation with psychologists and public health experts for how to cover this so we don't make it worse. Um, is there a protocol we could come up with for covering high conflict so we don't make it worse? One more or are we, do we do other things? Let's do one fast one. All right, from Rachel, what advice do you have for teens and younger adults uh, who are facing high con the high conflict pervasive in society? What steps can they take to be engaged but not engage in the high conflict itself? Oh, that's a good one. I, I mean, I think uh, there's like so much opportunity, right? For, for teenagers and educators and parents to kind of get into this conflict to make it worse or make it better. <laughs> and one of the things that I think a lot about is how we can make the connection or help kids make the connection between the conflict they see in their own lives and the conflict they see in politics. What is useful, what is not useful, right? Um, what helps them resolve conflict in their own lives or their classroom or their family and what they don't see in politics, what they'd like to see. So I think connecting those different arenas is really kind of exciting for, for kids, for everyone, but is one way to kind of get at that because you don't want to just tune out, right? That's the natural understandable impulse is just check out. And I think a lot of young people have done that, right? Understandably. Um, on the other hand, uh, because it feels so hopeless, and this is where I think journalism has failed as in some cases by making it feel so relentlessly hopeless, right? Even when it's not. Um, so that's where I think kind of trying to find that sweet spot of clear eyed, open hearts, looking at the world as it is, but looking at it in full, right? And connecting it to your own experiences in the world, which tend to be more complex than what we see on CNN or Fox. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. All right, so we know that we are about time, at time. And uh, so before we, we give our thanks and we conclude, we gotta have an icebreaker winner. So Alan, name off three responses that you pulled because Amanda will choose the most intriguing one. Go for it. Okay, okay, I have four because there were four that really jumped out. Alan, okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, well, just let me have one thing. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, arguing with dad over whether kitchen knives are sharp. 
uh, arguing with mom over the right way to open a fridge. Uh, a married couple arguing over the most effective way to load a dishwasher and whether an inflatable birthday monkey is joyful or tacky. Wow, those are fantastic, every single one. Uh, you had me at inflatable birthday. <laughs> How, I mean, that's just a clear winner. Oh my gosh. Uh, All right, Anne, we will send you an email. You have won a book thanks to your uh, inflatable <laughs> birthday monkey conflict. I'd love to know how that ends, by the way. Stay tuned. All right, and with that, uh, you know, I think boys to men said it best. It's so hard to say goodbye, but it is the top of the hour. And I know we could listen to you, Amanda, for hours, continue this conversation, but we know you have a busy schedule. Um, Sabrina, thank you. You've got a busy schedule and we know everyone has, you know, jam-packed schedules these days. So with that, we just want to say a major, a huge thank you um, to Amanda Ripley for the work that you're doing and the ways in which you just continue to teach and inspire and inform uh, and really impact the work that we're doing, not just in journalism, but also in our everyday lives. So thank you to you. Sabrina Tavernisi, thank you so much for your time and for joining us. Uh, to the SJN team, thank you. And for everyone who joined, we are recording this, so you will get the recording. All right, so we are going to let our talented colleague, Kristen Merritt, take us out, and we will put her social media uh, info in the chat for you, so Just you can be sure to follow there. her. Beautiful. Thank you, and to everyone, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It starts about the way you think you would. It starts about the way you think you should. A story told at a lonely pace. I tried and failed to be your only one. Writing a script that ends with credits rolling. Music placed in the sun. But seasons change and things won't stay too warm. I seem to play as if it was forever eternal, so late. Knowing the truth, we're rear its ugly head. Though what's the use? No one dare ever say. Bring an umbrella to a perfect, boundless day. Sunset can't be bought. <laughs> Let bygones be gone. Let try hearts be. Long.